Welcome to Lesson 5b, Helmholtz Vortex Theorems. In this lesson, we'll discuss four Helmholtz Vortex Theorems and note that these apply to inviscid barotropic flow with conservative body forces. Typically, we'll be assuming incompressible flow. We'll also introduce vortex tubes and vortex rings, and we'll apply the theorems to a viscously decaying line vortex. I note that these restrictions are the same ones we had for Kelvin's circulation theorem. Helmholtz theorem number one, vortex lines move with the fluid. This follows actually directly from Kelvin's circulation theorem. If these are our streamlines and we have some vortex line with vorticity pointing that way, which means it's spinning like this, and we define some closed contour C that includes that vortex line, and this is at time t. By the way, a vortex line is a line of concentrated vorticity. Well, as this vortex moves along, it will move with the flow so that at some later time, t plus delta t, it will have moved here. Again, if we take a contour around that vortex line, it must have the same circulation. For example, Suppose we calculate the circulation at t equal t. Kelvin's theorem tells us that d gamma dt equals zero. In other words, gamma does not change following the fluid. So gamma at t plus delta t, a later time, must be the same, since we are letting this closed contour also move with the fluid. Here's another way to look at it. I copied and pasted the above diagram, and let's delete this contour. Suppose the vortex line moved faster than the fluid so that our closed contour was here at time t plus delta t. Then this contour is moving with the fluid, but the line vortex is not. The gamma here is not the same as the gamma we calculated at t equal t. In other words, gamma at t plus delta t does not equal gamma of t. But this violates Kelvin's circulation theorem, so this is not correct. Therefore, we conclude the vortex line must move with the fluid. This is Helmholtz's first theorem. Helmholtz's second theorem says that the strength of a vortex tube, where we define strength as its circulation, is constant along its length. I'll make an analogy, namely think about a stream tube and incompressible conservation of mass. A stream tube, by the way, is a group or bundle of streamlines. Think of it as a thick streamline. Suppose we have a converging section of flow, and we have a whole bunch of streamlines across this area. As the area contracts, the streamlines get closer to conserve mass. This is our stream tube, and I've only drawn a few streamlines, but imagine an infinite number of streamlines within here. The boundaries of the stream tube are streamlines themselves. As the stream tube narrows, as we see here, its cross-sectional area gets smaller. The velocity increases. The flow must speed up to accommodate flow through a smaller area compared to here. That's just simple conservation of mass. But volume flow rate v dot remains constant. Mathematically, v dot is the integral over area a, u dot dA. This must be constant along a stream tube. This must hold to conserve mass in an incompressible flow. Now consider a vortex tube, which we'll define as a group or bundle of vortex lines, similar to how we define the stream tube. In this case, we have a group of vortex lines, which are converging as shown, and these vortex lines have a direction. Like our stream tube, the boundaries are formed by vortex lines. Each of these vortex lines has some circulation, and there's a net circulation around the entire vortex tube. We can calculate this at any location along the vortex tube. I note also that the streamlines can be in some other arbitrary direction. Analogous to the stream tube, where we said as the stream tube narrows, the velocity increases. Here, as the vortex tube narrows, the magnitude of vorticity must increase, where there's a vorticity of each of these vortex lines. In this case, Omega here is smaller than omega here because of our statement. The vortex lines are converging, therefore omega must increase. However, the circulation around the entire vortex tube must remain the same. This is the same gamma we had here, provided we include the entire vortex tube. Again, mathematically, gamma, the circulation, was defined as the integral over the closed contour C of u dot ds, or 
we showed in a previous lesson that this was also the area integral of omega dot dA. And this must be constant along a vortex tube. Hopefully you can see the direct analogy between this equation and this equation. Physically, as the area gets smaller, we have less area for this integral. And in order for circulation to stay constant, omega must increase. In this case, our closed contour C would encircle this area here, and then later this area here. Therefore, circulation is constant along a vortex tube. This is Helmholtz's second theorem. Helmholtz's third theorem says that a vortex tube cannot end in a fluid. This follows directly from Helmholtz's second theorem. Again, consider some vortex tube. We know that gamma must be constant anywhere along this vortex tube, provided we're encircling the whole thing. But what if this vortex tube just ended here? What's the circulation around this portion of the fluid? Well, I think it'd be zero. Why do you say that? Because there's nothing there. Yeah, I like my brother's brain. <laughs> Can't you ever be nice? You're right that gamma is zero there. Again, our analogy with a stream tube, just as a stream tube cannot end in a fluid because the mass would have to either appear or disappear, a vortex tube cannot end in a fluid. What would happen to the vorticity? It would have to just disappear also. Note that a vortex tube can end at a wall. I'll sketch it this way. Suppose this is our wall and this is our vortex tube. That's okay, and if it bothers you, you can imagine a mirror image vortex tube underneath the wall. This is not real, of course, but the method of images is often used in fluid mechanics to explain concepts like this and to solve for these problems mathematically. We call this the method of images. You can also have a vortex ring where the vortex closes on itself and the circulation remains constant around this vortex at any point along the ring. A smoke ring is a common example. We'll discuss vortex rings in more detail in the next lesson. For now we conclude a vortex tube cannot end in a fluid. This is Helmholtz's third theorem. Finally Helmholtz's fourth theorem says that the strength and the circulation of a vortex tube remains constant in time. Again this follows directly from Calvin's circulation theorem namely d gamma dt equals zero for a vortex line. And if we group a bunch of vortex lines together, it also applies for a vortex tube. I'll remind you of our restrictions. We have an inviscid barotropic flow with conservative body forces, such as gravity. These restrictions apply for all of these Helmholtz theorems, by the way. Well, if the circulation is not changing as we move along with the fluid, then it follows directly that circulation of a vortex tube is constant in time. This is a summary of Helmholtz's fourth theorem. Finally, I want to show that Helmholtz's fourth theorem, which is this, still works even with net viscous forces, as long as the viscous forces are inside our contour C, the contour that we use to calculate circulation. For example, consider the viscous decay of a line vortex. Later on we'll show how to solve this mathematically. Let's sketch circumferential velocity component u theta for a line vortex which decays like 1 over r. I'll draw three times t equals 0, t equal t1, and t equal t2. At t equals 0 there's a singularity with infinite speed at the origin and velocity decays like 1 over r. If this were an inviscid flow, it would remain this way for all time. But if we allow viscous effects, we'll get a viscous core that blends into the outer flow, where the velocity actually is zero at the origin, and then rises and blends into the inviscid vortex outside the viscous core. At a later time, the viscous core grows, but still blends into the outer flow. The point is that if we take a closed contour, C, for any of these cases, as long as C is outside the viscous core, it sees the exact same u theta at the exact same location, since this is part of the outer core in any of these three diagrams. And when you integrate gamma equal integral of u dot ds, we see that gamma at t equal zero must equal gamma at t equal t1, since this integral will be identical. And the same thing is true at t equal t2. 
In other words, gamma is a constant as this vortex decays in time, provided that contour C is outside the viscous core. Viscous effects grow with time, but far enough away, the effects of the viscous core have not reached our contour yet. Thus, we can make this statement. The point is that although Helmholtz's theorems apply to inviscid flow, you can have regions where viscous effects are important and in fact dominate, but Helmholtz's theorems still apply. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.